Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, U.S. Farm Report originates in upstate New York. And our first guest, Mr. Jack Murray, NFO member from Herkimer County. Earlier today, our U.S. Farm Report crew traveled out of Syracuse, New York, to Herkimer County, where we have been visiting on the dairy farm of Richard Yule. Meeting us at the turnoff point on the thruway was Jack Murray. Jack is state vice president of NFO. And incidentally, a right good navigator, because you got us here, Jack, with no problems. Well, we know the area pretty well. We uh, travel there pretty good. And you you've know. lived here all your life, haven't right. you? Right. Uh, I was born and raised right in central New York here. Well, you know, uh, this is quite a story here uh, that Dick Yule tells about NFO. Now, although you and uh, your good fellow NFO members uh, of Oneida County uh, are not within uh, Dick's County, at least you neighbor on well, this county, don't you? What we do is we, we kind of rub off from Herkimer <laughs> County, you know, and the, the, the goodwill just blends across. There's any boundary lines, really. The only reason you got a boundary line is so they can keep the record straight in the national office, but yeah. outside of that, it just kind of runs together. Well, tell me about uh, membership through uh, New York State. How is it going? It's going pretty well, really. I mean, generally during the summer, you'll have a, a slowdown because the farmers have to get back to the field, but we've got a few more paid men, and we've had a, an attitude of, of uh, willingness and, and winningness, I might mm -hmm. say, that everybody feels that now, finally, uh, the processors are ready to accept collective bargaining, and uh, outside, whenever we talk to uh, farmers who aren't in NFO, uh, we don't get any more of the, the radical attitudes. They sit and listen, and we're getting members to join, even with the increased dues. It's changing, Jack. Yes. Uh, it's changing it's, all over the country. We find that. And uh, uh, you've just expressed that, that change in general attitude uh, through this part of the country. Right. I think one of the, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we find this change is uh, we're willing to get in the middle of a fight. It doesn't make any difference of... Uh, of uh, local thing or helping a guy build a barn or any little any little problem or challenge we're always willing to to help and and be there in fact you've just gone through a pretty good <coughs> fight uh here involving some twenty seven thousand dairy farmers covering uh two entire states and part of a third new york new right. jersey and part of pennsylvania tell us about this well this uh this fight that we were talking about was uh when our four major co-ops in Federal Order 2, which covers these states, petitioned the Secretary of Agriculture to lower Class 2 milk by 18 cents. Now, this would have meant about a 9 to 9.5 uh, to 10 cents, rather, off of all farmers' blend price in New York and New Jersey in this Order 2 area. So, in other words, you're taking uh, 10 cents off of 27,000 farmers, and we'd have been talking about a little over $9 million to these people. And this is right out of their paycheck. And we felt that. Uh, since the co-ops are the people that the farmers are paying, these are our hired men are going down there to uh, uh, deduct this from our paychecks. The only thing left to do is for NFO to go down there and tell them the full story that the farmers back here that are members of these co-ops aren't willing to take this cut, that the hired men are going down there on their own. And this is what we proceeded to do. And uh, we had bankers and uh, feed machine, uh, farm machinery dealers and feed grain dealers and all of these agribusiness people. We stirred these people and uh, they wrote letters to the Secretary of Agriculture. We got non-members to write letters. And anyways, uh, finally, the decision is, has been rendered by the Secretary of Agriculture that there will be no cut. Well, that's wonderful. You know, we're getting success stories in, uh, in marketing all over the country. What are some of your recent success stories in marketing in New York State? Well, one of the uh, prime ones in central New York, uh, through the area here, we have a number of counties and uh, some stuff coming out of Maine that's going into our meat a marketing arrangement we have with a with a packer and this is working real well we get paid above any other market and uh, as part of it's because we deliver it to him and there's no competition there i mean we just take it in and put it through right through the plant we have a man in the plant to watch it killed and we have very few problems we worked on this now for about two and a half years mm -hmm. and it's working real smooth i mean it's got down now to where the farmer's got something that's got to go he calls us up and we got a week or so to get it ready for him or, or you can pick it up within the next day whatever it has to be and and, and we move stuff right out mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. In the local area here, we pick up our cows and calves, go Mondays and Thursdays, and all the farmers know it, and we got everything moving pretty well. What about you, uh, Jack? <laughs> what kind of farming do you do? Are you a dairy farmer? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is, uh, I'm a dairy farmer. Uh, I raise most of my own replacements. Uh, no feed grains. I just raise the, the roughage to feed mm -hmm. these cattle. 
I milk 42 milkers, and all together I got around 65 head. I plan to expand just a little bit in order to make a living, but <laughs> not nothing, no tremendous expansion, though. No. Well, you're finding, I guess, that more farmers are discovering that they can't do it alone. Well, yes, this is the attitude that we found uh, as, well, like when I go out to work for NFO, I run into people that have expanded. They've gone through this period. They've doubled the size of their dairy in less than 10 years. They've doubled the, the size of their debt. They've doubled their investment. And they still haven't got any more cash, and they're working twice as hard. And they say, why? What's wrong? And this is where NFO comes in and says, get, let's get together and get the price we deserve. Let's cover our bills and pay our bills in 30 days like we should. That's what our problem is. Our problem isn't in, in any more efficiency. Everybody else in the United States works less hours. We have to work more. After visiting with Jack Murray in Herkimer County, New York, our entire U.S. Farm Report crew moved to near Seneca Falls and talked with Bud Barbet, whose renewed dairy operation exists there. Bud, how you doing? All right, Bill. Good to see you, man. You know, uh, this has been a real pleasure for all of our U.S. Farm Report uh, crew today to come out to your place and uh, see the great comeback that you've accomplished. Now, we haven't mentioned to our audiences yet uh, the disastrous fire that really set you back, and I'd like for you to tell us about that. The fire in general that we yeah. had here? Well, it was a year ago, May 30th, or uh, March 30th. It was in the dead of the winter, almost the dead of the winter, 1.30 in the morning. And uh, it was a very fast uh, thing. Uh, 45 minutes, we lost 121 head of cattle, a good 75% of our machinery, and just about all our buildings. I didn't come out with a hammer. Oh, boy. I understand uh, from Charlie uh, in our visiting that uh, had the wind not been right. blowing away right, from the right, house, right. you would have lost the home, right. too. We, we would have lost everything. I don't think we would have come out with anything, and we'd have been darn lucky if the, if the family had walked out of the house. Now, that was a year ago? A year ago, March 30th. March. March 30th. Now, uh, do you have any idea of what your dollar loss was? This is awful hard. I know it is. All I can tell you is how much I'm in debt now. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, that might just tell the story better than, uh, uh, than what the loss was at that time. But you lost a you, herd you'd been building on for a long, long time, well, didn't you? Well, we, we, left, we left Jersey with the thought that we com could come up here and build another herd yeah. within a year. And we were doing pretty darn well at it. And uh, we were just, boy, things were just looking up and re lo really looking nice herd-wise. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this catastrophe had to come along and hit. Uh, we had uh, 147, and uh, we lost 121 out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we buried all of them, that machinery and everything, out behind the present barn that we have now. And, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. It, you'd be surprised how this brings you close to people. Uh, the people around here, in general, oh, they, they literally came out of the walls to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, bulldozers, trucks, people, fire departments, everything. It, it, was, it was something uh, of an experience of its own of how people can uh, go to another yeah. person's help. I yeah. mean, over and above my catastrophe. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't know what else to tell you, Bill. You ask questions, and I'll try and okay, answer Okay, well, let me just ask this, bud. Uh, after the shock of this thing, yeah. of course, you had to set about to go back into business. Uh, how long were you without income? Nine months. And what did you do during that time? Did you just start out and, uh, and uh, rebuild? And, well, we, uh, we, first of all, it took, uh, we had to think of how we wanted to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in plain English, we had to look for a little extra money. I was going to ask, Bud, if insurance covered it all. It never does, yeah. does it? Between 65 and 70 percent, around yeah. in there, roughly. It was you take an overall of all the insurance. Mm -hmm. But in this period of time now, with uh, a year and three or four months having gone mm -hmm. by, uh, at what point are you in your in your dairy operation? What do you mean, how we've expanded? What, yeah, where, where are you now? today in terms of uh, your cow herd, your replacement program, and well, so forth? We're now approximately at uh, 200 head, and uh, we're pretty rough to get this many animals together. Uh, of course, 
we hear the bankers holler all the time that mm -hmm. money is tight. So uh, we can't, uh, of course, uh, finance all these cattle in one place. Mm -hmm. And we have to, uh, let's say we, well, let's talk about farmers in general. We have to uh, finance cattle uh, like somebody would a new car or a television, such tremendous interest rates, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But um, a low period of time, in other words, uh, these things should be long-term loans and things like this to help the farmer because of the overhead and everything mm -hmm. we have. Now, I'm going to uh, blow my own horn here because of the problem I had here a year and three yeah. months ago. I wish the devil I had a little bit longer-term loans. But uh, this two or three different banks chipped together the money in different two or three different loans, and we finally got a herd put back in here. And a lot of them I've been buying myself, mm -hmm. uh, turning my milk checks back into cattle so that they would grow and and it sort of mushrooms and gets bigger and bigger as we can uh, get more animals in here and get more production so that we can cover the overhead mm -hmm. because i don't forget i have got, i've got overhead that i left behind me before the fire that i'm trying to catch up with you have overhead on top of overhead that's right <laughs> and uh, we we have to catch up with it yeah. and uh, you spoke about when i decided to go back into this it was the night we had the fire, and the fire was about two hours old, and I stood up on a ramp there by the farm, and I said, that night, I said, I was going to go back into it. I said, this, this is what I know, and this is what I want to do. And uh, I knew if, uh, if I could keep my health, I'll make it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of people that have been helping me. Of course, you've got that 2% all over that, uh, you know, might like to pull you under or no, something like that. Sure. Right. Yeah. Go ahead with your question. Well, I, don't want to go I, want to just, I just want to say this, Bud, that uh, when you decided to rebuild yeah. the barn, for example, mm -hmm. the physical facility, you really did it exactly the way you felt it should be done in terms of your future growth, didn't you? Yes. Uh, I think I've done it up to about 75% of what I yeah. you know, wanted to do. I was held back a little bit on financing. I can see now that it needs a little more polish at a uh, few changes here and there. And uh, it has to grow gradually as the money yeah. comes in because it's, uh, it's just nil as far as being able to borrow any money to, you know, to, yeah. to expand anymore or anything. What kind of square footage do you have in the structure, do you know, roughly? Oh, now you're getting nasty. <laughs> uh, we had 80 by 204, so yeah. let's do a little simple multiplication. You right? do it, will you? No, not, not right, right now because me. you got me too nervous. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, it's a great-looking structure, right. I can tell you that. Uh, your dad says you're kind of a perfectionist, so when you talk about uh, maybe some sophistications it lacks, in your opinion, yeah. we can blame that on your uh, perfection attitudes, okay? Oh, yeah. To yeah. this guy, it looks like a great barn and a great well, facility. It bugs me, you know. Yeah. You either do one thing the right way or you don't do it. Yeah. And, and I don't want to say I don't want to do it, but uh, so this is what I have to put up with. How many, uh, how many acres are you farming? Very close to 800. And uh, what are you growing? You, you're growing some corn, and it looks mighty close good. Close to 300 acres yeah. of corn. Uh, Your dad... Uh, close to 200 acres of hay. Uh, there's uh, some pasture around the buildings yeah. and things. It was uh, close to close to 40 acres of wheat, um, 45 acres of oats, and uh, oh, of course I had a little retirement land here to get into the, some of these government mm -hmm. payments, like some of these rich fellows do. Yeah, yeah. I have to get that point in. <laughs> uh -huh. Very well. Right. We went down and uh, watched you uh, doing a little field work today. Yeah. on a great piece of equipment uh, that uh, cuts your alfalfa. Right. It uh, also crimps it and... Right. Uh, Conditions and it and puts yeah, it right in a row. Right ready, in a row. Right. Ready, ready to, for a field chopper or a baler. Right. Now, right. in this particular instance, uh, uh, this alfalfa uh, is down pretty much because of uh, some heavy rain. Oh, and yeah. It's also kind of full of a, a weed or two. Yeah, it has a wild... Um, some up here call it a, a, a wild carrot. Uh, home in Jersey where we came from, uh, I believe some of the people down there call it a maiden's lace or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the actual name. My mother had a good name for it. Yeah. A maiden's lace or something like that. I forget what it I is. I think uh, Butch Swaim, who's accompanying our crew, uh, yeah. says back in Iowa it's called uh, 
uh, something like a bird's nest or well or there you go like now we got sort. three names to think about <laughs> At any rate, that's the, the white uh, right. flower, the right. weed with the white flower right. that, uh, that is in your alfalfa. But uh, I don't think it's going to hurt the TDN as far as the cow I doubt goes. if it does, and no. the cow's going to enjoy that right. weed and not know that she's eating it, right? right? Well, Give by the way, now, change in her diet. True. Uh -huh. you're, you're dry chopping this, aren't you? It's about uh, half dry. Yeah. Half dry. I don't like to feed it too sloppy and wet. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes right through them. They get more out of it yeah. by uh, keeping it along the halage line, let's yeah. put it this way. Earlier in the day, we uh, saw one of your hands uh, uh, dry chopping right. in a field close to your dad's house. This was some alfalfa that I think had been cut about a week ago and was in, in pretty good shape, pretty dry. Uh, no, this was cut um, Sunday afternoon. Oh, that, it, well, then it hasn't been a, a week right. by any means. Of course, means, we're it? talking today is Wednesday, and uh, I believe I'm right. Yeah. yeah and it was cut Sunday afternoon. Well, it, it, it dried pretty well in three days. Yeah, but if you'd have turned over the row, you'd have seen it's pretty wet. Otherwise, it would have been <laughs> going out the back into the baler yeah. instead of that chopper. Well, now, are you uh, chopping all your corn and putting it into the silo for feed? No, no, no. We hope to put some in, in a, what a, I'll give you the farm terminology, is high, mm -hmm. high moisture ear corn. Yeah. Um, uh, it's to sort of stem off the uh, overhead of the farm by, it's a way of, producing at least 75 percent of the grain that goes mm -hmm. into cow and then by only buying a concentrate to mix with it you can stem off quite a bit of your overhead and keep a little more of your own money without mm -hmm. keeping everybody in the in the community rich well <clears throat> you um, you have accomplished a great thing here bud with uh, automation uh, the way uh, you're mm -hmm. able to feed is uh, is uh, really outstanding and uh, I'd like for you to just explain that to our viewers what your automated setup is well it would be hard to explain it without seeing it, but uh, roughly we feed uh, approximately 200 head, and I would say 13 to 15 minutes. Uh, and this is about uh, four, four and a half tons of roughage, mm -hmm. in which that wagon you saw holes. Uh, we know because we've weighed it at this yeah. point. And uh, that's it, the automation. It's done with elevators and <laughs> new modern yeah. automation methods. Well, with this, uh, with this control equipment you have, uh, you can really control uh, the amount of feed going to the cow oh, yeah. Oh, in, yeah. in, the, uh, in the milking parlor. Would you explain oh, yeah. that to us? Yes. Uh, as I explained to Butch before, Mr. Swain, uh, these feeders, you can take your uh, feed weights from your IBM records and keeping the cattle in uh, lactational groups, we can therefore feed some cows that are high producers more feed at the same rate of speed mm -hmm. as the cow that's giving maybe 40 pounds and has less amount of feed. We can feed her the same amount of feed in the same amount of time with these uh, dribble type methods with yes. these uh, auto automatic or electronic feeders mm -hmm. that are in the milking parlor. It's, uh, it's something to see. I suppose next year, the year after, uh, this will be uh, obsolete, and they'll come out with something else. Well, at least for but now, it's probably the latest thing, and it's, uh, it's just a system of dialing and, yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. pushing a button. That's right. But do you uh, use some kind of a special technique in keeping your herd records? No, I develop them all myself. I'm not... It's something that I had, and I... I it's a funny thing. I developed this from a, um, I saw a camp down in New Jersey uh -huh. that used to keep track of their children when they were in swimming. <laughs> With the little uh, tags? With those little tags. Like you use. Right. Each, uh, when, when each child or so was in each different swimming area, uh -huh. or whatever group they were in, whether they were beginners or what have you, uh, they'd move these an uh, animals. They'd move these children to different groups, <laughs> see? So I got this idea because uh, I had to keep the cattle in my barn in lactational groups. And I wanted about four groups, fresh animals, high mm -hmm. producers, middle of lactation, end of lactation, dry mm -hmm. animals. So I said the best way to do these is I'll category these animals and put them on little tags. And I said, as I move them around in the barn, I can keep track of them because it found, I found it every month I was making out new lists. And geez, yeah. when you get up over 100 cows and now close to 200 or 200, it's uh, you're constantly making out new lists 
Well, I don't have a blonde secretary in here to keep it up for me, so I, I better do something where I can keep it up. Well, it looks uh, it looks like a very efficient system. Well, good. Now, if, uh, if you find any patents or anything on this, let me know. I'll let right you uh, have all the financial benefits. <laughs> go ahead. I need it. Yeah. Let's go inside the barn for a minute and yeah. uh, talk about some of the very expensive uh, equipment that you have in there. Mm. For example, in the tank room, all right. Uh, what is your capacity in the two tanks there? Well, one, the smaller of the two is a 500 gallon, uh, holding uh, 5,500 pounds of milk. Wait a minute, I think I'm right on that, yes. The larger tank is a 1,000 gallon, holding 9,600 9, and some pounds mm -hmm. of milk. What is your current uh, capacity in terms of production from this herd of 200? How much milk well, are you What am I making now? Yeah. Well, now we're off in production, uh, number one, because of this crazy weather. Of course, you can't foresee or do anything mm -hmm. about that. And then, of course, uh, you have the nature to contend with with the cow, because a lot of them right now are at their uh, peak of pregnancy. Right. And, um, of course, I'll say peak of pregnancy for the people that don't understand our cow mm -hmm. lingo. And it's uh, at the real juicy time of their lactation, where they're going to all start freshening yes. again. And we try and maintain this to come back in the fall when the price of milk is a higher mm -hmm. price. Um, how, how else can I, uh, I... I guess I've answered that for you. Yeah, except you didn't give me any uh, poundage figures. Do you pounds have, yeah. now? Yeah. Well, pounds now is approximately 5,000 a day. Pounds back two or three months ago when I was doing a little better and we had more animals milking was approximately a day, approximately 66 to 6,800 a day. Now, you have some plans for the future, some growth. What do you anticipate your production will be when that growth is realized? Well, we'd like to project and hope that we can make somewhere between the 7,500 and 8,000 pound per day level. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, hard to do on a dairy farm. I think any farmer will agree with me. Sometimes you can't project everything in the future right. on pencil and paper because uh, we are so close to nature on a dairy farm that uh, you can give and take, and uh, you can drop two or pick up three cows mm -hmm. like anything, it, and it, it, it all makes a difference. Well, leaving the uh, tank room for right. a moment, let's go into the milking parlor now. Right. Uh, this is uh, a sawtooth-type uh, milking parlor. Right. Uh, with a capability of milking five cows on each side, or right. ten cows at a time. Right. Uh, would you uh, describe uh, the equipment there to our viewers and explain just the routine that goes on there? Well, it, it's a low line. Uh, I think they call it a low line, low profile milking system, sawtooth, herringbone uh, type parlor. Mm -hmm. uh, double five is a terminology that some farmers use. It can milk 10 cows, and we've got it down basically to approximately moving the cow in, washing her, testing her, milking her, and turning her out in approximately seven to eight minutes mm -hmm. per animal. Uh, we're milking now approximately 150, and you know, I'd say two hours and 45 mm -hmm. minutes. I think this could be polished up a little bit. Right now, we, we have a little bit of a, a washing problem with them if they were uh, a little bit cleaner. I think it'd be they'd move through a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. The fellas don't have to wash so much mm -hmm. on them. But uh, I make a law with them: wash the udder before no. you put the machine on. Well, this uh, sure system that uh, we've seen a great deal of here is a dandy, isn't it? Uh, uh, I'm not saying it because I bought it and I'm stuck with it, but uh, I like it. And uh, the first day I tried it, I swore up and down that uh, I must have been off my rocker. <laughs> but uh, now we're in on it, uh, not because I have it, as I said, but it's working out pretty good. And as I say, it can do it a little more polish here and there. And it all, it'll all call come as we learn, the cattle learn, the men will learn, and we'll, we'll get at it. It looked to uh, us, as we watched your milking system in operation, that uh, the milk uh, is never uh, exposed to the air. It's never touched. No. No. Uh, would you uh, explain how, so how the milk flows directly, in the system? Right, right. It goes directly from the machine, from the udder of the cow, in the machine, through stainless steel pipes, 
glass and pumped, then goes through a, a gravity type filtering system and directly into the tank. And I would say within minutes, chill down to uh, roughly 35 to 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say maybe by an hour, hour and a half later, it's down to 33, 34, 35 degrees. And all of this contributes to an extremely low bacteria count. Low bacteria sure. and very good clean milk. Right. right. Another great thing that you have here is your manure system. Now, manure, if it isn't handled with a system like you have, can be one heck of a problem in the dairy business. Yeah, the public is hollering. The public is getting more prone to this manure problem on mm. the dairy farmer or, let's say, the chicken farmer or the hog farmer or what. But uh, let's not forget, we have to do something with it. Yeah. And this stuff does grow our crops to a right. certain extent. It is good. Let's not waste it. Uh, we just can't d dispose of it just because it smells. True. Uh, so we, we try and wash it away into a 10,000-gallon tank out of our parlor, and then we pump it out and take it out into the fields and spread it on the fields and mm -hmm. plow it under just as quick as we can to keep the public from having to smell it. Mm -hmm. But it's always not quite that easy. Uh, for us, all right, we had this happen to us. We had this catastrophe. We had to go into this. And we are quite readily close to some people here that I don't think would favor the smell. <laughs> so we more or less were, nobody actually said we had to do it, but uh, we knew what's coming. And we like to live with our community. We like to do, you know, what we, we think they would like it to do with us. In other words, do unto them like yes. you I'd have do unto you. And I might add, knowing you as I do now, bud, that you wouldn't have it any other way. You want it done the best way possible. Well, sometimes that's not too easy to do, money-wise, as I stated But you're before. doing it. You're right. doing it. Well, and we you're hope. to be congratulated. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and so ends this week's coverage from upstate New York. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at the same time on this same station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Okay.